Okay, welcome. Uh, thank you for your engagement this evening. My name is Scott Parr. Uh, I'm a proud principal at Steel Canyon High School. And this evening we are going to be covering uh, some, uh, it's a draft. I want to keep that in mind. This is a draft of our uh, reopening plan. So we've engaged stakeholders over the course of the last month, um, including our, our staff leadership through our big picture team, our, our department chairs, as well as whole staff earlier in the week. We've engaged our governing board, our PTO, our, our, some students through ASB. Um, and largely what this plan is developed through the guidance of the CDC, the California Department of Public Health, California Department of Education, in the San Diego County Office of Education. Uh, additionally, we've utilized local resources, paying close attention to what's happening in the big districts around our county, including Sweetwater, uh, including San Diego Unified, and our more closely our, our friends that we work closely with at the Grossmont Union High School District, as well as our neighbor, um, Helix Charter High School. Um, tonight's plan is gonna focus on two different components mainly. Uh, we'll discuss health and safety, and we'll discuss our instructional program. Uh, after that, we get into a couple of things such as transportation, and then our extra and co-curricular. So we will address all of those items. Uh, thank you for the questions that you have provided me through the chat, or not through the chat, but through the survey. Um, they've helped me um, try to provide and answer those questions in advance. We do expect to have a lot of questions throughout this evening and we're going to ask you to please submit them through the chat. I want to introduce uh, my co-hosts as our members of my team which is our assistant principals Paula Delgado and Mr. Paul Battle. Uh, Mr. Battle is going to be curating the chat this evening um, so please send your messages and questions to Paul Battle. I will not be um, as I go through the presentation I will not be monitoring the chat so he's going to be monitoring the chat uh, he may be able to respond to your question directly um, or what will happen is when we get through with our first part, which will be on health and safety, uh, we'll have an opportunity for a little Q&A and, and Mr. Battle will, will um, address questions to me, ask me questions, allow me to respond to anything uh, involving health and safety. And then we'll have another opportunity for a Q&A uh, after we get through our instructional program as well as transportation and extracurriculars. Uh, and we'll close with a, with a Q&A until all the questions uh, have been exhausted. We do have a large group tonight. Um, this is our biggest uh, forum that we are holding. We held one this morning uh, and we've our second one this evening and we're having uh, two tomorrow as well and we're offering translation services uh, for that. So if anyone else in your community was not able to take advantage today, or did not get the email, maybe it got sent to their spam or their junk or for whatever reason, please encourage them to engage tomorrow and share the information uh, that you received. Our plan, uh, what you see again, I wanna reiterate, this is not a draft. We're here to uh, reveal some, some, some plans uh, and collect feedback and gather input. Uh, we have a survey that we have generated which we'll be pushing out uh, either at the end of the day tomorrow, but more likely on Monday morning. So it'll be after we've completed all of our uh, community forums and give the community time to digest. And then we will uh, provide a survey early next week to gather your input and feedback to see um, if there's anything that, that we missed or anything that, that we need to add or take away. Um, and then at the middle of July or so, we plan on having a board meeting and sending our final reopening plan to, the, to our governing board for approval. So at that meeting, we would hold also a community forum to allow the community uh, an opportunity to speak to our board prior to, to any action taken. Um, so with that, I will uh, go ahead and begin. Uh, and again, I wanna remind, um, this will happen throughout. Don't send, if you have questions, don't send them to me, send them to Mr. Battle. He will be monitoring the chat and then we will interact um, through that. Okay, so as we move along, as again, I wanna say these are resources. Our plan is developed with the health and guidance uh, of many um, national, state, and local officials through those guidance, as well as some local schools and educational leaders. 
First part we're going to discuss is uh, health and safety. Uh, health and safety is always our number one priority. We know that uh, in order to optimize learning in the classroom, students need to feel safe, our teachers need to feel safe, and our families need to feel safe that they're sending their children to a school uh, where they are well supervised, where they are safe, and, and it's a healthy learning environment. So uh, again, we start with that because that's our number one priority. So the eight things we're gonna discuss is how to promote healthy hygiene, cleaning, disinfecting, and ventilation, physical distancing, protective equipment, symptom screening, visitors and volunteers, how we can limit student movement, and then additional protocols that we still will need to develop uh, to address uh, reopening of school. Uh, so we'll start with uh, promoting healthy hygiene. Uh, we're going to have an active role where we teach, reinforce and reteach hygiene practices, uh, mostly washing hands, avoiding contact with the face, covering of coughs and sneezes with the elbow. We will have these activities posted on everybody's syllabus, making sure it's reinforced in the classroom, signs on the walls, in the bathrooms and in the hallways and on doors. Uh, we have a little slideshow uh, with lessons that we'll put on our website and social media to make sure that we are uh, teaching, reinforcing and reteaching healthy hygiene practices. We've installed hand sanitizer throughout the campus, including at the entrance of every single room on campus. And our facilities manager's done a great job to ensure that we have adequate supplies for months, months in advance, based on our rate of usage. And the rate of usage for when school starts for the 2021 school year. For cleaning, disinfecting, and ventilation, uh, we, the guidelines ask us to clean and disinfect frequently touched sur uh, surfaces at least daily. Uh, we plan to meet and exceed those guidelines. Uh, we're providing, uh, we will be doing it daily with our night crew custodian. Uh, we're looking to also employ a daytime custodian to rotate around campus and clean high frequency areas such as bathrooms, common areas, tables. Our teachers are gonna be equipped with uh, cleaning supplies, spray, as well as paper towels so that they can uh, sanitize between classes, between usages. Uh, and and uh, uh, we are encouraging students to bring their own water to school and discouraging the use of our communal drinking fountains. Uh, they will be accessible because we don't think it's appropriate to withhold water for students if they need it, but we are encouraging students to bring their own water bottle to school and use our, our bottle filling stations. Uh, we do have a couple of them. Uh, we wish we're looking at opportunities to install more, but we want to make sure that we are constantly encouraging students to bring their own water with them to school. And uh, one thing that we've identified that we can do that's not necessarily provided in the, in the, in the guidelines, but increasing our ventilation, the, the filter grade, replacing them regularly, and increasing the filter grade to MERV 13, which is the highest uh, grade that we can we can provide. As far as distancing goes, we need to greatly reduce the number of students on campus in a given day in order to meet the six foot guidelines in classrooms. So we have uh, measured our, our classrooms and designed. We are confident that we can fit in classrooms 15 to 18 students uh, at six feet apart. Uh, and the, all the classrooms are different size. Some are much bigger than others and some will accommodate more. But on average, we are looking at about 15 to 18 uh, in the classroom at a time that we can support. We're including uh, installing some signage on the ground around some point of service areas. Uh, we'll be using tape in some areas, such as the nutrition, finance, attendance, receptionist, uh, AP secretary's office, a registrar, as well as our staff and student bathrooms. Our, we'll, including that, we'll have signage on, on doors, walls, and hallways, which includes a variety of things, which we'll get to in a minute, like uh, protective equipment, hygiene, as well as uh, distancing. Um, we will, uh, for also looking at uh, partitions and plexiglass that will help distancing when, or, or help separate, provide separation when distancing isn't possible. Uh, a lot of these do include point of service areas for our receptionist, looking at our secretary's office, looking at our finance clerk, uh, and um, also in some classrooms, such as our science labs, where students 
um, they're sitting face to face, and that's an, and and a, we have adjusted many of the face to face seating arrangements. But there's some that that won't won't change. Our science labs, in particular, our geography labs. So when students are still sitting face to face, trying to install some uh, plexiglass and partitions where distancing isn't possible. Uh, as far as PPE goes, our, our personal pr protective equipment. Uh, mandatory, we are expecting at this point, mandatory face coverings for staff, students, and visitors. Uh, even since our meeting this morning, re reading some guidance from the governor's office saying that that still is under consideration and how uh, face coverings will be um, enforced in schools. So our plan is always is going to be dynamic and is going to meet the current needs. We understand that we've developed a plan and we're sharing a plan today that is subject to change. Uh, in either direction, whether it's more strict or less strict. So we did uh, even just a, an hour ago or so saw some guidance that the governor is, cons uh, they are still considering face coverings and they understand how it's such a nuanced um, uh, issue. Uh, we will provide exemptions and exceptions in face coverings for those with health risks. Uh, and we will have a supply for those that forget. Uh, we're gonna be providing face shields for our staff who engage with our, our, our student body in teaching and learning. So our teachers and instructional aides, our academic coaches will be provided face shields, which is a clear, a clear mask so that um, lips can be seen and it's not so muffling of, of the audible response. Uh, it was asked this morning if students can wear face shields and I believe that answer is yes. We think that's an acceptable face covering uh, for to wear and face covering. And again, for PPE installing uh, signage for doors, walls, and hallways, constantly reminding and, and promoting uh, protective equipment for all. Symptom screening is gonna be one of our, our bigger challenges. Uh, so we will engage in uh, promote passive screening uh, where everyone would be expected to do a symptom check and attempt their check before they leave the house and come to campus. And that includes staff, students, as well as visitors and volunteers. Uh, in addition to that, we're expected to conduct active temperature, active symptom checks. So when students arrive to school and when staff arrive to school, we need to do a symptom screen and a temperature check before they're allowed to enter campus. So we're looking to see how we can do that. The symptom screen includes nine questions and a temp check with a device that just takes uh, a second or so to, um, to take their temperature. And, um, and anyone who does not pass the symptom check or the temp check, and we've been given guidance of 100.4 degrees, if it's equal to or greater than that, then they would be excluded from camp, uh, campus for the day. Uh, so figuring out how we, can, how we can do that efficiently and get our students in, in their classrooms is the challenge that, we have, that we're taking on right now figuring out a digital platform that we can do so students can show us that they uh, have answered the symptom screen and then we can do a quick scan of their temp and allow them onto campus. As far as visitors and volunteers go, uh, we are discouraging visitors and volunteers from uh, attending, from showing up to, to campus and trying to encourage any and all communication to occur virtually. So if it can, if a meeting can be held virtually, uh, then it should. And if somebody does need to come to camp campus for any reason, uh, that an appointment is made in advance so that we can prepare for the arrival. We will be changing some of our check-in procedures. We will not be allowing um, visitors to in the reception area to kind of wait as a waiting area. We'll, help, we'll allow them to check in and we'll have uh, them wait outside in the open air where we think it'd be safer for people to wait until their meeting uh, or their appointment can, can be held. Uh, and that would include uh, counseling appointments, registrar appointments, assistant principal appointments, teacher meetings, um, as well as uh, anything in the counseling office or attendance. So trying to promote as much virtual communication as possible. So we're reducing face-to-face uh, -face interaction. Uh, we'll also have a check-in place where we will have symptom screening for visitors and volunteers uh, as well. Uh, limiting students out of class. So during class time, we always need our students in class, more so now than ever. We're gonna have campus supervision monitoring the uh, traffic in the bathrooms, limiting it to one to two students in the restroom at a time. Uh, and we'll have tape on the ground 
and trying to enforce distancing outside the restroom. So we'll have to limit um, teaching assistance. So a lot of students take a TA to fill a block in their schedule, allows them an opportunity to help teachers as well as have, maybe have some time to do some work. Uh, but they are gonna be taking up an essential seat in the classroom that we need to maximize for students. Uh, they also are the uh, subject to high student movement. So we need to reduce students allowed in a lot of TAs are in the reception area uh, or getting retrieving mail or retrieving duplicating for students. And so we're gonna make sure we keep those students in the classroom. So trying to reduce and find alternatives for it for TAs so we can limit uh, student movement. And anytime student needs to uh, visit their counselor or an assistant principal or anybody on campus in the main office, trying to make sure they have a pass for that. So some type of process where they request a meeting and then they are retrieved for that meeting and sent back to class. So we're trying to reduce traffic in that office uh, so they're not sitting around waiting to talk to a counselor or an assistant principal or anyone in attendance office. So trying to, to limit student movement uh, as much as possible. Uh, and then in addition to that, we have a lot of work to do as far as protocols and establishing our plans for response. So we need to make sure we do what we say we're gonna do. And that starts with coming up with plans for a lot of different scenarios. So if, some, if when a student or staff displays symptoms on campus, what is our response? Uh, are they automatically excluded for, and if they are, for how many days? What's our response if a student or staff is confirmed positive or has direct contact with someone who's confirmed positive? Uh, what do we do if we have a community outbreak? What do we need to communicate to parents as far as drop off and pickup goes? How are those plans to change? A lot of um, protocols that we will need to be establishing over the next uh, two to four weeks so that we can open school and have a plan that's clearly communicated uh, to our community so they know what to expect when school starts uh, in August. Um, so I believe that brings us to our first kind of break. Uh, so I'm going to defer to to Mr. Battle. I do see there's a few people who have chat sent chats to me. And I want to make sure those people know, please send your chats to Mr. Battle. He's going to be monitoring the chat and will address questions publicly for everybody uh, in, in the forum. Um, so he's going to we're going to address questions specifically about health and safety at this point, And then we'll get to the other questions on um, uh, later on in our forum. All right, thank you, Mr. Parr. Good evening, everyone, and welcome. Um, the first question we had was, will this uh, presentation and or, and or slideshow be available to the public after this meeting? Yeah, I can, I, I'm a little hesitant to, to provide it to people who weren't present, uh, but I, I, can, I can download a PDF of it and make it available. I, don't, I wanna stress that it's not a final draft, and so I'm, we're, I'm a little concerned that if we just provide it for the masses, they will think this is approved and adopted and this is it. So, uh, but I can, I will make it available. I can send it by PDF to all of us uh, here this evening. We're also recording this session and we can post that on our, on our website for all to access as well. All right. Thank you. You, you had discussed how um, many of the protocols are in, in development as we speak, but there's a specific question about the contingency plan. Should a teacher or a student test positive and what the, the process would be? Yeah, we haven't received uh, specific guidance on that yet. So I'm hesitant to say we will do this, that, or the other. Um, but we, we do know that, that we will have a protocol and we will have safety precautions for all involved. Uh, and that will meet the health requirements that we're going to be provided. We've been uh, provided requirements on how to open. Uh, and additional requirements are going to be provided on how to operate while open. And so we're still waiting on some uh, best practices as well as some guidance from our leaders uh, on that. Right. And that will be shared w w as soon as we know. So we'll, we'll continue to engage and communicate with the public what our plans are and have resources available. Right. Thank you, sir. Uh, so there's a question about hydration. Uh, you'd mentioned bringing, encouraging students to bring their own bottle of water. Um, is, is it possible to bring multiple bottles of water? And can you elaborate again on the filling stations for water? Yeah, we've got, uh, I know our, main, our fillings, we have a filling station up at the top of the K stairs, and then there's another one in the gym. The one at the gym isn't um, highly accessible. It's not a great, high, it's not a high traffic area. Um, so those are our two water filling stations. I believe those are the only two. 
Um, and students can use the drinking fountains to fill water. We're just trying to discourage them in uh, you know, getting their face down there in, in the drinking fountain. Uh, students are allowed to bring water to school in their backpacks and they can bring a, a couple of water bottles to school if they wish. We want our students to be hydrated. It's important and it's for optimal learning opportunities that they do stay hydrated. Um, so if we're not, um, we are not shutting off the drinking fountains. We're just trying to encourage them to, to bring their own water. We think that's the safest route. And again, uh, the protocols are being developed as we speak, but uh, will the temperatures be processed, be monitoring of that be conducted every day? Yes, uh, temp, uh, symptom screening should be done. Uh, the guidelines we've received, all staff, students, visitors, and volunteers should be symptom screened prior to entering campus daily. All right, thank you. Um, as far as um, facial coverings and or facial shields, is there a specific kind that needs to be uh, acquired or will we be providing them or how will that all work? Uh, there is no uh, specific um, better or worse coverings. There's no minimum requirement for coverings. It's just simply having some type of uh, a cloth covering at minimum that covers the face and the nose so that um, it protects both the, the student from others and others from, from the student. And uh, whether it's a face shield, a cloth, uh, whether it's a, a full wrap around, uh, like a, you know, there's a variety of them. And uh, we expect that most, you know, almost everybody has and is used to face coverings by now and will have their own. Uh, we will have, I don't have any, a series of basic masks on hand for staff, students, uh, and volunteers and visitors who forget them and don't have them. So we are purchasing a few thousand to have on hand for those. But we, uh, you know, it's gonna be some, it's, it's pretty common these days and I think everybody will have will want to bring one. All right. Uh, should a student uh, have an elevated temperature upon arrival at school, will that student be marked absent? And is the expectation that that student will have to be tested before they can return? I uh, have not received any guidance uh, along those lines. Um, so that student would most likely, it, hopefully they would have an excused absence is what we would expect due to sickness. Uh, and depending on how those symptoms developed would, would determine whether how long they would be excluded from campus. So there hasn't been any uh, guidelines provided strictly upon if you have a stomach ache, then you can't come back for two weeks. So that has not uh, been provided. So, but if there is a symptom check where somebody does need to, to go home and those symptoms subside, um, the, that type of information is what we're looking at for how long would a student be excluded from campus if they just had a symptom, if they had a temperature, or then finally, if they uh, had the flu, or if they had uh, tested positive for COVID. So those guidelines, we are still um, awaiting some of the specifics about that, and we'll provide when we have a plan for them. Uh, are there any specifics related to wearing masks during physical activity or physical education, ENS? Uh, no, not, nothing specific. Um, again, I think that the governor, the wearing of masks is a very nuanced subject and a lot of things are being considered. So uh, I don't think anything has been solidified as far as wearing masks at school, if they have to have them during passing periods, if they can take them off during class time or how they're going to wear them during uh, physical activity uh, with m medical exemptions. So right now, the, the guidance we're providing that we've been given is expect to um, wear face coverings at school and then uh, all the nuances are still being uh, worked out. All right, thank you. Will the library be open for students? Uh, yes, we do plan to have the library open. It's likely going to be uh, needed um, for students uh, during classes in lieu of TA, where we have students kind of spaced out. Uh, but yeah, we do expect to offer our facilities such as the library. Uh, will students need to arrive earlier to participate in the screening? Uh, we are expecting at this point, most likely a setup time of about 645 for symptom screening. Um, we don't, you know, we only have 
our classified staff, we're expecting our administrative team and our campus supervisors to be conducting the symptom screenings and our, our classified staff for them, their contract starts at 645. So uh, we probably would not, we would not be able to allow people on campus before 645. Okay, I'm just running through some, some similar questions. Um, will teachers have their temperatures taken as well? Yes. If they have an elevated temperature, what will, what will happen? They, anyone, it, it falls for everybody, staff, students, visitors, volunteers, everybody has to engage in a symptom screening prior to entering campus. And anybody who fails the symptom screen and temperature check would be excluded for campus uh, for that day. All right, if students have uh, no first block and arrive later in the day, will the same process unfold for them? Yeah, we all have a plan in place for a late arriving students and staff. Okay, with uh, the arrival time and all these procedures that will probably be taking place, will there be accommodations for attendance as a result? Did they uh, maybe that sort of thing? Yeah, students who have excused absences uh, will be given the, the grace that they deserve uh, under our in our uh, grading policies, and we will we will be understanding of uh, individual situations, especially as it refers to sickness, um, particularly that um, due to coronavirus. All right, um, most of the other questions are related to uh, extracurricular athletics, but or the instructional program. So I think we're ready to proceed to the next part of the presentation tonight. Thank you, Mr. Park. Okay, wonderful. Thank you, and I just want to remind everybody to keep seeing that chats are popping up. Uh, I'm not monitoring the chat, so please direct them to Mr. Battle. So if you have questions or comments or anything, please direct them to Mr. Battle. I will not see the chat until uh, the, our session is over. Okay, moving on to our instructional program. Thank you. Um, our first day of school is scheduled for August 13th. And um, unless you hear otherwise, we can expect school to start August 13th. Uh, we will be providing two main options of learning. Uh, we'll be providing a blended option uh, and a full distance learning. So distance learning is, is it's full-time learning, but it's, on, it's basic, it's meant to be on a short-term basis where students, uh, this is due to the pandemic, students are gonna engage in distance learning. And our blended option, um, provides students on-site supports. So we're gonna get them on campus as much as, we, as much as we safely can have them on campus. We're gonna have them in classrooms, engage in, in teaching and learning activities. So those two options we're gonna be providing for our students. And the, both those options provide kind of um, a dynamic phase in, phase out, uh, where we would adjust accordingly based on, um, you know, the, the current situation in the community, whether it's on site or around the county. Uh, all, whatever option is provided, we are gonna have high expectations for teaching and learning. Um, and we're gonna include wraparound supports with our academic coaches, which includes social emotional supports through our counseling office, uh, including all kinds of, all the supports required for our students with disabilities and our English learners. And we're gonna provide a survey, as I mentioned, uh, early next week, you can expect that July 6. And that survey is going to ask you which one you would choose. But I want you to know that whatever it is you select is not any type of final decision. We're just trying to do a temperature check of our family to see how many of our students at this point in time, if we started right now, would you select a blended experience where your students are engaged uh, in on-campus learning activities as much as we can, or would you choose full distance learning? Uh, our blended model uh, will be dynamic and allow us the flexibility to adapt. Uh, and families will have the opportunity to utilize each model, whatever model they choose. So if they want full distance learning or if they want the blended model, we're gonna start by leaving that up to the families to choose. We're also gonna provide some flexibility within that decision. So if a family selects full distance learning and after a certain amount of time, whether their student's not being successful, whether uh, the risk is lowered, maybe the safety restrictions are lightening, 
and they want to select to utilize the on-campus supports that we can provide, we can redesignate that student as an on-campus learner through a meeting with the grade level team. Uh, and vice versa, if, if a if family selects um, our blended environment and isn't feeling safe or doesn't think the on-campus supports are, are necessary because you've got a motivated learner, then through a meeting with the grade level team, we can redesignate that student as a full distance learning. Uh, what we can't do is have students uh, jump in and out at their will and, and be distance learning for one class and then on site for another class or, or uh, you know, I'm just, I'm distance learning this week, but next week I'll be uh, full time back in the classroom. So we need to make sure there's processes. We need to know who we're expecting on campus and who we are not, who, we, who can't access the campus. So making sure that we are uh, building plans around distancing for those who inform us that they are selecting the on-site supports. Uh, again, I wanna reiterate, we're gonna have high expectations where our goal is gonna to be to advance and accelerate learning. Uh, in the plan in the spring, which I, in, in reflecting, we're very proud of the service that we provided to the community, um, but that was trying to maintain learning. Uh, caught, getting caught off guard and not being surprised or, and, and being, not being prepared and not having the experience, both staff and students wise, uh, just trying to maintain learning was our goal. Utilize what we learned in the spring and when we return in August, make sure that we're putting our students and our teachers in a position where we can advance and accelerate learning uh, as they would expect in an everyday classroom environment. Grades will be provided. We will not be operating on a credit, no credit. We will be providing grades. Uh, and attendance and engagement is going to be mandatory. So we do need those who are designated as on-site learners. They do have to show up. Attendance will be taken, even if the distance students will have to engage with their teachers regularly so that we can monitor learning, we can monitor progress. We do have to, to monitor attendance, and we do have to report that attendance out. So uh, attendance and engagement is going to be mandatory no matter what educational program uh, uh, your, our students and families select. Um, access to technology is going to be vital to student success. We will be issuing Chromebooks to all students. So we're changing, uh, modifying our one-to-one -one technology strategy. Over the past six, seven years, uh, we've accumulated a, a numerous devices to where we have a class set of devices in each classroom. So we reduced, we did not have a need for students to take a device home uh, from our school because we provided them in every single classroom. So we are adjusting that plan and we're going to provide and check out a device to every single student uh, so that they are not sharing that device with other students and that will be their device to use at school and at home. They'd be expected to bring that to school and take it home with them uh, every day. Uh, we'll also be working with families to mitigate internet challenges, uh, something that we worked hard at doing in the spring and we're going to continue those efforts just to make sure you know what if there see if there is anything we can do to overcome barriers that exist to learning so uh, it's going to require a lot of communication and engagement between us as a school and our families so that they share with us what the barriers are to learning so that we can see what type of uh, barriers we can remove and mitigate any challenges so we can optimize learning experiences for our students our curriculum, this is, this is important to note, all of our curriculum will be accessed digitally. Um, and this is, what, this is a key point because this allows us the flexibility to move in and out. It allows us the flexibility for students to um, designate as distance learning or blended learning and change their minds. And it allows us the flexibility to uh, migrate to a, a closed campus should we have to without any lag time in implementing instruction. So we've adopted Canvas as a learning management system. Uh, our staff is, is going to be busy over the next month learning Canvas and, and uploading our curriculum to Canvas. So whether our students are accessing curriculum in their, if they choose full distance learning or if they choose to utilize our on-site supports, the curriculum, the medium for the curriculum to be provided, all teaching and learning activities that are essential are gonna be provided through Canvas. On-site, uh, teachers are going to engage their students face-to-face -to, -face to delve a little bit deeper into those learning activities, some extended learning opportunities. They'll do some reteaching, pre-teaching, uh, as well as some community building 
and just doing some social emotional check-ins. One of the challenges we're gonna face as we open school is that we don't have any, our, our staff doesn't have rapport within their classroom yet. Uh, when we closed in spring, we had those teachers were with their students for nine weeks. So they had relationships established. So we're gonna have to work hard at the beginning to build community and establish those relationships. And that'll happen mainly through our face-to-face -face, uh, interactions. Um, and, and so that's, that's what we're providing in our on-campus support. Some extended learning opportunities, reteaching, pre-teaching, social emotional check-in, and uh, community building. And also uh, just making sure that we're able to clarify the expectations of the digital curriculum so that there's a check-in point that the students are meeting with their teacher um, at least at that point, once, twice, three times a week. We're gonna be moving through a four phase uh, model. Actually, if you, if you count traditional where we're open 100% every day, that's a five phase model. Um, and so our model kind of is at phase zero is a total school closure. So this is uh, a plan that all students need to prepare for uh, as we may have to close for a week or two weeks or a month based on something happening on campus or something happening in the community or at the county. So having a plan in place to address what we're gonna do if we have to close our doors for all of our students. Uh, where we're gonna be living to start the school year is phase one and phase two. So we'll have blended learning opportunities where students will be on campus one day per week up to two days per week. Uh, and that will largely be based on our ability to successfully implement our health and safety protocols, uh, particularly our screening, our symptom screening, um, how we're doing at distancing, at face coverings, how students are doing during breaks, uh, passing period, nutrition, food service, uh, and all the different things that require students to move around the campus at the same time. Those are the concerns which, which will, uh, we need to make sure we experience on some level and then scale up. So uh, we're likely gonna be living to start the school year in a phase one to a phase two model uh, from that point. Uh, phase three would, just, would be very similar. It would just be a true A-B schedule. So we'll talk a little bit about that as well. So I'm gonna go through, I'm gonna cover a couple of, of schedules. And again, I wanna reiterate, these are draft schedules. Uh, so I'm gonna start with our phase one and phase two because this is where we expect to start the school year if school were starting Monday, we would likely be starting in a phase one model, all right? And I'll, I'll give some details as to why that is as well. And we would be looking to quickly scale to phase two once we establish confidence in, our, in ourselves, in our staff, in our students, in our community, that we can uh, keep our students safe with our health and safety protocols uh, as well as our staff. So uh, if, school were just, if school were gonna start, we would likely be in a phase one model um, at this point. So and this is what that would look like. Our students would be divided up into four different cohorts. We would divide those students up by alpha uh, and they would be assigned a day of the week. For example, we would have A through, anyone whose last name began with A through D, they would be assigned Tuesday. Anybody who's uh, E through K would be assigned Wednesday. You were L through R would be assigned Thursday. And S through Z, you would be assigned Friday. Mondays, we would, we would have a total school closure, it would be all distance learning on Mondays, uh, and that would allow uh, teachers an opportunity to connect with students digitally, teachers an opportunity to meet with other, their teams to establish, make sure their curriculum is dialed in for the week. It also allows that our, our custodial and grounds crew to make sure that our, our whole campus has, has gone through a deep cleaning uh, on a weekly basis and we're ready to engage uh, with our students throughout that week. Uh, school would start at 7.30. Classes would be shorter. Classes would be 60 minutes in length. And that main reason we were shortening the school day is to provide grab and go lunch so that there are no classes after lunch. Students grab their lunch and they'd be expected to exit the uh, campus. Uh, and also we uh, have built in tutorial for st all students to access virtually. That tutorial time would be for, for everybody. When, no matter what cohort you're in, you know you have access to your teacher uh, for a specific time of day, Tuesday through Friday. Uh, and then providing just some student work time through our academic support program, which we call CAVE. So students can re receive additional sports, uh, supports 
after two o'clock thereafter, maybe even as late as four or five, depending on how many students are accessing our academic supports. As far as dividing up the alpha, uh, we would have to be pretty strict in, in limiting the number of exemptions that we would make. Uh, students and staff or families would not be able to select the day of the week. The only exemptions that we have um, defined that we know of already is students, uh, siblings with different last names. We would make sure that those, those students were allowed to attend on the same day. So we would have an exemption for that. And also an exemption we may, uh, transportation, which I'll get to in a little bit. Uh, transportation, we're gonna have to have some exemptions for transportation if there is a high concentration of a particular alpha group trying to get in, in one bus stop we may have to spread that out a little bit to make sure that all of our students have access to transportation. So we have identified those uh, alpha exemptions. And um, other than that, we need to be able to, we need to limit the exemptions. So we are pretty strict on who is attending which day of the week and students who are not assigned to school for a particular day uh, should not be on campus and wouldn't be allowed to, to enter campus. So moving from phase one to phase two, so as I said, if we started school tomorrow, uh, we would start in a phase one. And I said earlier, in class, we can support up to 50% of our student population. We are pretty confident in that, but starting off in a lighter scale to be sure that our, cl our classes are well balanced uh, and to be sure that our health and safety protocols aren't gonna be overwhelmed with too many students at one time. So making sure that we're able to get some practice with our protocols uh, and making sure that our, our classes are balanced appropriately. Once that's done, we think that we can move into a phase two environment. And of course, that would be subject to guidance from the county and what's happening um, in relation to the pandemic in the community at large. When we, phase, when we scale to phase two, we would be maintaining the exact same schedule. We just group cohorts together. So the difference between a phase one and a phase two for me, if, I'm, if my last name is Parr, I would be in uh, cohort number three. So as in addition to uh, coming to school on Thursday, I already know that when we scale to phase two, I'm gonna be coming to school on Tuesday as well. So the Tuesday, Thursday cohorts get grouped together and the Wednesday, Friday cohorts get grouped together. Uh, Mondays are still dedicated for school closure, for student work, distance learning, teacher meetings and deep cleaning. Uh, and then students will be arriving uh, two days a week, still offering grab and go lunch, still offering tutorial and still offering extended academic support times after hours as well. Um, we, and that's moving from phase one to phase two. S exact same schedule, it just increases the frequency that we're able to get students on campus accessing uh, our on-site support, uh, which we think are gonna be extremely valuable and vital to, to deep understanding of our, of our content. So as we move on phase one and phase two, I'm gonna, the next slide is gonna cover phase zero, uh, which is a, it's, a, it's a major departure from phase one and phase two, because I want everyone just to recognize while phase one and phase two speaks specifically to our uh, students who are engaged in the hybrid model, uh, while we're in phase one and phase two, we will also have students engaged in our full distance learning model. So they're not accessing our on-site supports. They'll have access to their teachers through tutorial time and through email on Mondays and through after hours and through tutorial. But they will not have access to uh, the classroom instruction time that's provided during the school day. Now, if we go to a phase zero, which is for total school closure, this puts everybody back in the same place. All the curriculum is already being disseminated uh, digitally through Canvas, so that's already in place. We already have a, a school closure schedule in place. So for example, if we were to close on a Tuesday, we should be able to implement this model on Wednesday and reduce the lag time to as close to zero as possible. Uh, and by lag time, I refer to, if you remember in the spring, we closed, and without any preparation, we didn't have distance learning ready to go. We experienced a 10-day lag time, which represented a two-week loss of learning with nothing provided. Uh, so we had two weeks, and then we moved our spring break, 
and then we had seven weeks of distance learning. So we had 10 days of absolute lost instruction. So our goal, if we have to close the school, is to lose zero days. So we have a plan in place. The curriculum is already being disseminated digitally, so there wouldn't be any loss of access to curriculum since it's already being accessed digitally. And now we're closed for school for everybody and our schedule looks a little bit different. Students would be accessing their, their classes twice a week. So you could go to uh, block one and two on Tuesday, block three and four on Wednesday. Again, you cycle back, block one and two on Thursday, block three and four on Friday. You don't have to divide up into cohorts because you're doing it digitally that whole class uh, don't matter which cohort, if you were distance learning or hybrid, that whole class can meet. Attendance at those meetings would be virtual and it would be mandatory and it would be ex expected that everybody attend. So we wanna make sure that if we do have to engage in any type of total school closure distance learning, we're gonna maintain high expectations of attendance, high expectations of grades. We will be offering grades through all of our, all of our processes. Uh, do notice a later start time with a total school closure providing more flexibility and providing more student work time uh, for that but still providing access direct access to teachers dedicated time twice a week so if you notice this time we've broken it up by uh, block of the day rather than by subject area uh, so I'll go ahead and pause there uh, the last two slides uh, or the last few slides that we have to discuss include transportation extracurriculars co-curriculars and, and student life. Um, so at this point, I wanna go to Mr. Battle in the chat to see uh, what we can do to address questions specifically about uh, our instructional program. All right, thank you, Ms. Spart. Um, we have some questions regarding, is there gonna be support to get familiar with the platform of Canvas for students and parents? Can you repeat that, please? You cut out a little bit. Oh, sorry about that. Yes, the question was uh, with the shift to Canvas as a as a platform we're going to be using for a lot of our instruction. Is there going to be um, support for parents to get familiar with the platform and and for students, obviously, also? Yeah, excellent. Uh, we do plan on providing some educational evenings, some resources, some with a parent education. Uh, I do want to point out, in addition to Canvas, we are adopting a new student information system as well. Uh, so I know many of you are familiar with Illuminate as a student information system. Uh, we did not switch by choice. Illuminate has retired from the student information system. And we spent a lot of time last year doing some research on new student information system. So we're confident in Aries and we're all getting trained up in Aries. So in addition to learning Canvas, we'll pro provide some parent education nights uh, and some access to resources on learning how to utilize uh, Aries to check grades as well as Canvas to monitor student progress and engagement. Uh, and I wanna point out our school is scheduled to start on a Thursday, uh, August 13th. That August 13th, that Thursday and Friday is likely gonna be uh, completely virtual learning for all students. And then we would start our hybrid supports uh, beginning the following Tuesday so that we started face-to-face uh, -face instruction at the beginning of a week rather than at the end of the week. So those first two classes would be held uh, virtually, whether you're a distance learning or a hybrid learner, uh, that Thursday and Friday, August 13th and 14th, is likely gonna be distance learning for all and a lot of training on Canvas uh, and how to use it and, and how to access curriculum on Canvas. All right, thank you. Um, uh, coming out of quarter four for returning families, um, how different will the experience from quarter four be with the distance learning model that, that we're gonna be uh, experiencing uh, this upcoming school year? Uh, I would think it's gonna be greatly, it, it should feel uh, very different uh, from the fact that we, we've prepared for this, uh, we've experienced this, our, our students have experienced this, and what we'll be providing are um, uh, high expectations for teaching and learning, uh, as well as, um, hold on just a second. I'm not sure where that's coming from. Okay. 
um, high expectations for engagement, high expectations for attendance, uh, high expectations with grades provided. Um, you know, it's, it's what was occurring, um, even though we'll still be operating in crisis, when we did not have time to prepare and we found out schools closed on Friday and uh, we were you know, truly operating uh, in, in places that we had never been before. So we expect the, um, that experience to be evident and we don't expect to feel like this is the first time for us doing uh, distance learning. So again, I think hopefully the, the feeling for all is that instead of trying to maintain continuity of learning, uh, it's felt by our staff students and families that our goal is to accelerate uh, learning. And um, so that's, that's what would hopefully be the, the main difference. All right. Um, will electives be offered in the upcoming school year or is the focus just going to be the core? No, we're gonna, we have our whole menu of courses offered. We conducted our, uh, our course requests and we've loaded our schedule as if we were uh, gonna be open full time. Uh, we know that's not going to be the case to start. We're still going to hold out hope that at some point throughout the school year, we may be able to return to traditional instruction where kids are coming every day and we've got 90 minute blocks of time. So we are maintaining all of our classes that we would as if we were open. Uh, they're just going to have a different experience, particularly in the elective performing arts and ENS classes. All right. Um... For students with 504s and or IEPs, um, what uh, levels of support will be able to provide those students as the school progresses through these different models? Yeah, we uh, plan to support fully all of, our, all of our students, especially those with students with disabilities and our English learners. Thank you. Um, as far as- We are meeting, exceeding um, the requirements of their, of their IEP. So they're gonna have access to their their advocates, they're gonna have access to their teachers uh, and any um, additional things that need to happen would happen through the IEP process. So we do plan on, on providing our full scale supports for students with disabilities and English learners. Um, as far as the effects on mental health uh, based on all these changes and different programs that we're trying to offer, is there gonna be um, extra support in the area of mental health? Uh, part of the extra support we're providing in mental, uh, mental health is our expanded role of our social worker. So we will have, for the first time ever, we'll have a full-time social worker uh, employed at Steel Canyon in addition to our uh, grade level counselors. So um, we will continue to work to see and do check-ins when we can on campus, both virtually and in person, to make sure that we are in tune with what students are experiencing and that we're monitoring their mental health and providing the supports that we can as a school to respond to their needs. All right. Um, we, as you reviewed the program uh, and the cohorts, um, how will that work for AB schedules? Uh, AB schedules will meet as frequently as possible. Uh, in your phase one model, AB classes are only gonna meet every other week. But when you get into a phase two model, your AB classes are gonna meet once a week. Uh, it's not ideal for teaching. Um, one of the, the, the challenges that we have in dealing with um, uh, not, not being allowed to have all of our students on campus at one time. All right, as far as uh, materials uh, to be successful, as far as Chromebooks and things like that, materials that students have that they need to bring back and or uh, get new materials, uh, when is that plan unfolding? Yeah, we'll be in touch uh, with our community about that. We are looking to, to establish some days in early August that are dedicated to a variety of things where families would sign up for a time slot on a specific day where they would come on campus to uh, return any materials that they had in their possession, check out a Chromebook, uh, check out any other texts that they may need throughout their classes, and also get their picture taken. Uh, because we think that uh, IDs are going to be an essential component for when we get uh, do our symptom screenings and get them checked in on campus. So we really want to make sure, do what we can to get our, our pictures taken early and get students' IDs in their hands so that we can scan them upon entry. 
All right, thank you. Um, if a student is engaging in full distance learning, uh, some of the folks are familiar with um, the FUEL program. Is it going to be FUEL or is it going to be directly with the teacher on campus? So I want to separate from iAcademy from our distance learning model. So distance learning is meant to be short term and meant to provide some fluidity based on what's happening uh, in the community and allow students the opportunity to kind of move in and move out uh, of our learning environment. So separating distance learning from iAcademy. iAcademy is long-term full-time distance learning, uh, which is um, very different from uh, our short-term distance learning plan. So iAcademy uses fuel. It's a, it's a different model. And uh, I would recommend families contact their grade level counselor if they're interested in iAcademy. That's a year long commitment uh, to that. And it's really meant for a specific population of people where we're designing di our distance learning model to be more engaging for the masses. Uh, you just mentioned counselors. Uh, when will counselors be available to discuss things like schedule changes and, and things like that? Our counselors first day reporting back, I believe is August 3rd. We hope to have schedules out, I believe by the end of that week. And I know they do a lot of time, they spend a lot of time communicating on that Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, doing schedule changes before school starts. All right, thank you. Uh, going back to the cohorts, if in the schedule of phase one and phase two, is it possible based on the circumstances between now and the opening of school, that we could possibly leapfrog phase one and start with phase two? Yeah, I would say anything is possible. Um, depending on the, the guidelines we're receiving and the best practices and what's happening uh, in the community at large, it sure seems to be not trending in that direction uh, currently. Uh, but you know, I'm a, a scientist and don't claim me, but you know, we're gonna do what's, what we're provided, the guidance that we're provided, we're gonna meet those requirements and exceed those requirements. So if we can start in phase two, we want students on campus as much as we can. We wanna provide all the learning opportunities, both in the classroom and out of the classroom that we can. Uh, and we're saddened that we're limited to, to being able to do that right now, but we all wanna always prioritize health and safety. So as much as we can get our students on campus, engaged in teaching and learning, the social environment, uh, the, the extracurricular environment, the, the campus life, uh, that's when we're operating at our best and that's when the, uh, learning is optimized. Uh, but in, until, until we get through this, uh, we're gonna have to be operating in some type of modified um, uh, learning opportunities, learning schedule, uh, but just know that we always want, and if we can, we're gonna scale up. So yeah, that clears up some confusion because other districts are sending the message that they might have um, a more open program than we currently are planning to. But just to be straight, that the um, it's really time will tell. We're kind of all watching the the forecasts and responding as such. So yeah, there are other districts that are talking about different plans. Um, but at the end of the day, when it comes time in a few weeks to really set it in stone that's when we'll be determining which phase we'll be in, correct? Yeah, we're, we're you know, uh, education for us is, is really governed by the state and that's been given to the local entities. So, uh, you know, I stay in touch with the county superintendent. We're on a charter leadership call every week. I stay in touch with the Grossmont District through weekly calls. Uh, I stay in touch with what's happening at Helix. My students uh, or my children uh, our elementary school age and city schools. My wife teaches in city schools. I listen to their board meetings. I'm aware of their plans. We know what's happening in Sweetwater. So we are uh, in tune with what's happening around the county and the guidance that's being provided from the state. And uh, we know that it's dynamic and it changes frequently. And we will be trying to, uh, our goal is to adopt a plan that is as dynamic with that and will allow us to uh, move in and out uh, without uh, uh, facing a lot of change, which is why what you see in these schedules is the times are exactly the same. And so that's, it's minimal disruption, uh, just allowing more access to campus. Um, as far as orientation or anything like that, getting access to campus to get familiar with the campus for incoming freshmen, is there any hope or possibility of that? 
Uh, we know we are going to have uh, freshman orientation. Uh, we don't know what that's going to look like at this point. It's usually on August 12th, which is the day before the first day of school. Uh, we have 600 freshmen that are registered to attend, and we're excited to, to welcome our new Cougars to campus. Uh, but we don't think that we can do it in one day, so we're trying to figure out how we can do that, whether it's going to be completely virtual uh, or if we're going to be able to spread it out and provide some access to campus. All right. Thank you very much, Mr. Parr. I'm going to be responding to some of these inquiries specifically because they're very, very specific. Uh, but I think we can move forward uh, at this point. Okay. All right. Thank you, Mr. Battle. Um, kind of wrapping this up with these last few slides. Uh, a lot of questions came through the survey about transportation. I want you to rest assured that we will be providing transportation to our families in need. Um, and I know there's going to be a lot of follow-up questions with that. So I look forward to hearing them. I uh, do know that student capacity on buses is going to be greatly reduced. We have had conversations with the transportation department at the district office. They uh, provide us with transportation. And so we've revealed kind of the draft of our plan to them. And they are confident that they can meet our needs uh, at a 25% level. Buses are operating likely at a 25% level, which means no more than 14 students allowed on the bus at a time. So that's another reason why starting off in a phase one program will likely be necessary is transportation require, may require it. Um, stops and routes, as we've known them in the past, may have to be adjusted. So I want to prepare you for that, and we will release that information as soon as we have it. Uh, and we will provide access to signing up for transportation should be coming in the next week. And uh, for the first time, we're gonna be providing that on our website, which is gonna be something that's gonna be useful and easier for our community to access transportation information from our website rather than having to go to uh, an unfamiliar website, the, the Smart Union High School website. Um, symptom, and screening, symptom screening will be provided for all students prior to entering the bus. Uh, and we've been asked to notify anyone using transportation. It's recommended that parents, they're highly encouraged to stay at the bus stop until their student enters the bus. Uh, and for that reason is if the student fails a symptom check and, is, and they don't have a parent there, uh, our bus drivers can't leave a student at a bus stop. They have to take that student. So what that does is puts a student who has failed a symptom screen on the bus with the rest of the students who pass the symptom screen in rather uh, close quarters. They would then, when they get to school, they would then be directed uh, to the nurse's office where we could handle it properly. So for that reason, parents are encouraged to stay at the bus stop until they see their student enter the bus. Uh, students who do sit, take the bus will not be subjected to a second symptom screen. We would just have to, uh, as they exited the bus, we would give them whatever type of notification, whether it's a sticker or stamp or something, so that the, our, our teachers and, and campus officials know that that student has uh, been screened at some point prior to entering campus uh, that day. Uh, it's probably going to be utilizing some form of sticker on ID cards to verify students that have been symptom screened. Uh, athletics, uh, again, with regards to this is similar to our philosophy regarding everything. We want to provide a comprehensive education. That's the thing, something that we pride ourselves in at Steel Canyon High School is being a comprehensive charter high school, and there's not a whole lot of them around. A lot of the charter schools have, are specialty schools, and we pride ourselves on being a comprehensive school that offers athletics, performing arts, student life uh, as well. We want athletics. We want our students to, to learn on, their, uh, on the field and in the pool and on their courts as much as they learn in the classroom. We think that those are some of the most purest classrooms on campus are there outside at practice. Uh, but we don't control that. So athletics is determined by the state CIF. Currently, fall sports are scheduled to begin August 1st, with football starting a day earlier on July 31st. Um, now, we haven't re received any other information aside from that. There is an announcement that we know that's coming on or around July 20th from state CIF regarding what type of modifications may need to take place in order to conduct safely a fall sports season. And I want to know, I want just make sure everybody's aware. Currently, um, anybody that's practicing now is falling under the guidance of day camps. 
So there are no Steel Canyon sanctioned athletics going on right now. There are no CIF athletics going on right now, even though it's a lot of our kids and our coaches out there, whether it's with water polo or football or cross country, those are day camps. Those are out of season sports and those are not governed by the school or CIF. So that's out of season sports. Once the fall season sport starts, that's when Steel Canyon and CIF gets involved and we'll have to follow the guidance provided by state CIF as filtered through the county level CIF. Uh, same thing with performing arts. We want our kids on stage. We want them performing in front of the biggest audiences that we can provide, uh, but we're likely gonna have to be, a, that's gonna be a modified experience for the time being. So until we can provide that, the big audience and all the kids on stage together, uh, I do know that in talking to our, our performing arts department, our teachers are gonna do what they can to provide them the best experience with the parameters that we're placed under. Uh, and we're gonna be willing to expand and do what we can if, if it's considered safe to do so. So always prioritizing safety and maximizing the student experience based on those guidelines. Uh, and that kind of concludes all of the information that, that I have for our reopening plan. Uh, I wanna again say that we will be receiving, uh, sending you a survey and listening to that feedback and making adjustments before we take an official plan to the board, hopefully for approval uh, sometime in the next couple of weeks. I wanna go back to our chat now and see what types of questions we still have as we close for the evening. All right, <clears throat> uh, just going back to cohorts, if a family happens to have um, students with different last names and obviously transportation, if you're providing transportation, will that be something that can be changed or facilitated for to make sure the family can stay together? Yeah, we've had the two exemptions for alpha that we've identified that we understand will we'll have to provide and are willing to do so is a family members with different last names and for transportation reasons, uh, families who uh, you may have, we may have a high concentration with only 14, 15 students allowed on a bus at a time, and you've got 20 students and a particular alpha, we may have to, to make some exemptions and, and split that up a little bit. So we're, we're cognizant of that. Um, aside from that, we will, will probably will not be allowed to make too many uh, exemptions for selecting the day of the week. Um, as far as the different phases, uh, we, we can assume that athletics or extracurricular activities will kind of have different phases as well as things open up? Uh, yeah, that's all determined by, by CIF. So I would hope that they have a plan that's dynamic and fluid and allows for adjustment uh, if things are going well. Uh, the day camps that, that's going on right now, there's phases there. So everything um, you know, is operating in phases where they, they open it up a little bit, monitor it, and then if they're confident in the practices and things are going well, then they try to scale. So I wouldn't expect anything different from CIF, and we'll hear more from them uh, at the end of the month. All right. Uh, the clubs on campus, will they, those still exist? Yeah, we, we are gonna do what we can to provide the student life, uh, likely gonna be virtual since you won't have access to all the students in one spot at, at lunchtime as we're usually able to provide but it, uh, it's be up to our, our club leaders and our club advisors to, to engage those people and promote those clubs. We'll figure out how we can promote clubs, uh, both on site and virtually, to make sure we are, especially our new students, our freshmen, understand that, that we try to provide um, gr um, common experiences for everybody. So we, we do that through our 70 to 80 uh, authorized clubs that we have on campus. Okay. Um, just cleaning up a couple of loose ones. Um, you, did you mention that parents would have to stay by their students at the bus stop, even if they're in a gated community? Uh, I don't think that's anything that we can require. That's best practice is we've been informed and we read the guidance and we're hoping that parents will be present at the bus stop until their student enters the bus. Uh, and for reason, if they fail a symptom screen, that student has to get on the bus anyways uh, and would be possibly um, uh, not contaminating, but being contagious to students that are on the bus in the tight quarters there. So bus drivers can't leave kids at the bus stop no matter what their symptom screen reveals. So they will be symptom screened. And if there's no parent there, that student's getting on the bus regardless. 
Okay. If parents, we had talked about posting this and some of the parameters of that. Um, if parents want to kind of study the phase one, phase two to see how it affects their students and start um, discussing it with their students, will the phases, even in draft form, be available to reference on the website? Uh, yeah, I would say if any, I will um, send this a PDF version of this slideshow to all the people who are present today. Sounds good. Okay, Mr. Parr, thank you very much. There's been a lot of support also in our efforts, and we really appreciate that. And that wraps up the majority of the chat. Okay. Uh, we'll, we'll, we're here for you all summer. I want to thank uh, Mr. Battle, Ms. Delgado, for helping tonight work the, the weight room and the, the chat. Um, our team and our staff uh, are aware of the great challenge that lies in front of us. Um, there's a good chance that we uh, embrace this challenge for the whole school year. Um, and we're prepared to do that, but know that we can't do that without your support. You are our partners in education, uh, and we look forward um, to working with you and doing the best we can to provide, uh, continue to provide the student success uh, that we're known for. So I want to thank you all for your engagement tonight, and we'll be here all summer. If you have questions, feel free to contact us, email us, call us, and we'll be as responsive as we can. Um, so as, after that, I hope you all have a, a wonderful evening and summer. Hope you get to enjoy your summer. Hey, everyone's gone. Got you muted. Yeah, Got to remove everybody one by one. It's crazy. I was, I was helping you do it. <laughs> that is weird. I think the Spanish questions, I, I was thinking about tomorrow.